Hello and welcome to our webinar topic number six from the Match Project. My name is Lasse and I am your host throughout this series of webinars. Every day this week we have spent one hour and are spending one hour to discuss readiness for circular economy and eight key dimensions to keep in mind when preparing for a circular transition. Since Monday, we have hosted five webinars, one general introduction to the Match platform. Tuesday, we looked at the dimension of organization, followed by strategy and business model innovation. And yesterday, we covered product and service innovation, along with manufacturing and value chain. They are all available uh, to stream on our website under the webinars tab, the same place as you signed up for this webinar. This episode is recorded as well and will be available later today. During the presentations, you can use the Q&A function uh, to raise any questions for our speakers. The chat is open for you to share any relevant knowledge for the rest of us and also to present yourself so we know who we have on board. Just remember to uh, change the settings in the chat to uh, sending the message to all and not just the panelists. Today, we will be spending 20 minutes on the topic of technology and data, and we will back this with some industry specific data. This leaves us with approximately five minutes for questions and plenty of dialogue. Then we will do a three minute uh, break and transition to the next topic, which is use support and maintenance. We will get some additional participants for the second part only. So I will do a short repetition of what I'm saying now, but you can just stay on the line, grab some coffee or do your favorite yoga pose. The first topic, technology and data is introduced by Professor Tim McAloon, who has led the Match Project. His research uh, is focused on design for X, sustainability and circular economy, during which Tim has supported especially the maritime and heavy industries to introduce data collection to improve circularity. He will be assisted by Associate Professor Daniela Pigoso, who has a background in industrial and environmental engineering. So her main focus is on eco design, sustainability and circular economy. Tim, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Lesa, and good afternoon, everybody. Nice to be here again for our webinars, uh, webinar series. So let's have a look into technology and data. So this, as Lasse said, is our uh, sixth webinar. And just as a reminder, when you go into the webinar website, you can see now the icons have changed a little uh, where you can see the webinars from yesterday. So focusing in on technology and data, what we're going to be looking at, first of all, is why is it important to look at technology and data from a circular economy perspective? Well, I think there's many reasons to do that. Um, and as we've spoken about all the way along this webinar series so far, there's many opportunities to see how we can lengthen the lifetime of products uh, uh, if that's necessary and if that's a, a good thing to do to um, increase the usability or the amount of uh, use, use that the products get in their lifetimes and hopefully also to use fewer products uh, for the same value created. And technology and data we see as being a big enabler for that. One of the um, reports that we think is clearly the most interesting and the most insightful to, uh, to look at in terms of technology and data, even though it's uh, almost five years old now, is from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. It's the Intelligent Assets Unlocking the Circular Economy Potential. And one of the things that this does in a very nice way is to give us some overview of the different main focus areas or you could say opportunities that we can see from using technology and data to enable and to support the circular economy. And I'm not sure if you're looking at this webinar on a telephone or maybe even on a tablet, this could be quite difficult to read. But uh, basically on the top row here, we have uh, different circular economy value drivers. The first column uh, is the knowledge of the location of the asset. So that's a classification they've made in this report. The second column is about uh, knowledge about the condition of the asset. And thirdly, it's about the availability of the asset. 
if you just think to not very much uh, further than three or four years ago, the amount of um, access we have today to sharing systems, for example, uh, car sharing systems, or any type of a sharing system or access to, to different products and services through some form of a platform solution. That is actually being made available today by technology and data, which we three or four years ago didn't have the access to in the same way. So I think this idea of, of looking at what is the location of the asset? If I want to go and share a car, is the one close by? What is the condition? So from the providers of the car sharing system, is it something that uh, one of our vehicles, does it need to be maintained? And then the availability in terms of both the, uh, the, the customer, the user and the provider, what is the availability so that we can start to plan, move the cars around, but also to get to the car if we're a customer. And then on the other axis here, on the gray axis, we have the reasons why uh, the location, the condition and the availability could be interesting. I just gave you one example. But uh, one overall reason could be to extend the youth, the uh, the use cycle uh, length of an asset. So we make sure that the asset is the product or the or the service is available for as long as possible. Another strategy could be to increase the utilization of an asset or a resource. So to make sure that we have as many people using it as possible, as I mentioned already in the beginning. The third reason could be to loop or cascade the asset throughout additional use cycles. For example, as I think there's companies in just about every uh, country in, in the European uh, setting, at least these days, which um, have two or three companies which are um, taking back used computers, used telephones, electronics, and refurbishing them and setting them out on the market again. This could be a, a way to, to loop and to cascade the assets. And then finally, to regenerate material capital and, uh, and sorry, natural capital from um, the, the products and systems we have. If everything else fails, we need to be able to make sure that we get the natural capital out. And what this report does nicely is to put the same matrix here onto some examples. And here you can see these aren't just ideas. It's not just a, an academic exercise. There are actually companies making business out of doing this. So these companies are just a a few examples of companies which are really uh, identifying the opportunities to be had by using uh, technology and data to provide services and ultimately to provide value which is decoupled from resource consumption. The last little insight I'd like to bring you from this uh, report that we're very inspired by from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is a nice example of how, for example, it is with a, uh, a printer. And you can see here, if I were to zoom in a little bit here, uh, maybe I should have done that before, it would have made it easier for you to, to see. But in terms of intelligent assets in the life cycle, uh, they transform all different parts of the life cycle. For example, uh, sensor technology helps us to monitor performance of, uh, uh, of a product through the transmitted data. It also helps us to redefine the maintenance loops for a particular product. And we've worked with companies that have been very, very active in doing exactly that and in increasing the, the maintenance um, or improving the maintenance efficiency. In terms of designing the actual product, we heard um, the day before yesterday that uh, around about 80% of the environmental um, characteristics of products are, are designed into the product in the first 20% of the, the product's uh, design phase. And this is where we can design in um, features and upgradability and monitorability if we design with a, the idea that we're going to be uh, using technology and data to help us to support our product. That should, in turn, give us improved components and uh, products which come onto the market. One, because they can communicate about themselves, and two, because uh, we can see their condition. And then this should hopefully ultimately give us the opportunity to extend the, uh, the use cycle through parts harvesting, reuse, recycling, and so forth. So that's some of the motivation for looking at technology and data. So what we've done in the MATCH project is to define technology and data readiness for circular economy in terms of how we're measuring your capabilities within companies to create value through enhanced data management, 
and sharing of the provided solutions because of that access to technology and data and that active utilization to technology and data. So here we have two important questions that we've been asking the, the companies and the users of the platform to uh, evaluate themselves on in terms of the readiness from a scale of not being started to being uh, scaled up or actually implementing uh, products in this area. And the first one is, how far is your company in applying uh, technology for product monitoring during the use phase? And this could be like the example I just showed you through sensor technology, through internet of things, through big data and so forth. So what level is the company actually using that? And some of the companies that we've been uh, surveying and some of the companies which have been using our platform have seen this as being highly relevant and they've been uh, working on this for a while. Others see it as relevant, but have not started. And others again, uh, see that for their particular business area, it is not uh, relevant for them. So this is giving a, an interesting spread and an interesting uh, demographic for us. And the second question here, which is also extremely important is to see how far is your company in applying technologies to support the products for extended lifetime? So this is by um, supporting the product throughout its life with uh, new spare parts, uh, design for repair, upgradability, and actually offering that to the, uh, the user with some form of a spare parts kit, um, which is maybe connected to the maintenance plan for the, the product or the asset. So that was the questions that we asked. And uh, Daniela, uh, we're going to turn to you now and ask, what does it look like in terms of the readiness overall compared to the other dimensions of the match uh, platform, but also within this one, who is the most ready in terms of sectors and sizes of companies and so forth? Yes, definitely. So all that I'm going to share with you just now comes from all the different companies that are in the platform today. And we have 330 plus companies across 16 different sectors. They are all manufacturing uh, companies and they, they've been uh, represented by more than 900 different users that are currently spread across the six continents. Um, and if we look into all of the other dimensions, we can see the technology and data is the dimension with the lowest redness of them all. So it's about 36% uh, of redness in the companies here. And what we can also see here is a quite different profile in relation to the previous dimensions. Any other? Yeah. Maybe if you just unshare and reshare your screen, the definition is not very good. Okay, let me do it. Any better now? Yes, much better. Thank you. Beautiful. Great. Thanks for that, Tim. Um, yeah, I was mentioning that what's really different for, for this dimension is that it's quite different in relation to the most ready sector, which in the case today is the electronics sector, followed by machinery. It's also quite different in relation to the type of the company. Here we can see that the business to consumer companies are the ones with the highest uh, readiness. And the same goes for the size of the company where large companies seems to have a higher readiness when it comes to technology and data. If we look at the two uh, specific areas we focused in here, we can see starting at monitoring during the use phase that most of the companies uh, have not started yet. And they're, they're trying to understand the potential for monitoring the product during the use phase by using sensors, IoT, or big data. But we can also see some of the companies already scaling that up. And if we click uh, on that one, we can see that the companies that are scaling up just now, they are mostly in five main sectors, electronics, machinery, minor products, pharma, and also vehicles. They are mostly big companies, but we can also see a participation of smaller companies, both from B2C and B2B areas. We can also see that companies that are scaling up uh, this uh, area, they're also quite strong in using technology for extended use, being either planning scale up or scaling that up already. 
And if we have a look at the overall uh, companies in here, we see that in general, they are between not really started yet and planning pilot implementation with a readiness of 1.7 in general. And it shows that companies are starting to uh, get data during the use phase about their products. And this is for sure helping them to provide better functions during the use phase, but also enabling them to use that data for enhancing the business model, the product design, and also having access to the products at the end of life. And we still see a good potential here in terms of taking advantage of new technologies such as 3D printing, for instance, for uh, developing spare parts and so forth that would make the use phase longer, and by doing that would enable decoupling value creation from resource consumption. Okay, so technology and data, really an important enabler for circular economy, but there is still a long way to go to, to companies to be able to unlock all of the opportunities that it can bring. Good, so back to you, Tim. Thank you. I just need to get the right presentation. I think I just stopped sharing my screen then. There we go. So yeah, thanks for that, Daniela. The case that we'd like to share with you today is uh, a case from Nova Nordisk. Nova Nordisk is a Danish um, but uh, multinational uh, company, uh, pharmaceuticals company, the biggest market being the insulin market. And uh, for insulin um, to, to uh, enter into the body to, to uh, fight or counteract diabetes, um, they're using devices. And uh, the device manufacturer is uh, also carried out by Nova Nordisk. So it's both the medicine and the devices for uh, administering this. And Nova Nordisk joined with us on the MATCH project actually for two cases. And this particular one, the accelerator program here was uh, as you can, uh, can see by the, the, the beautiful picture of the, uh, the nice people in this workshop here, was carried out in this particular one in uh, their factory in China. And basically it was comparing the factory in China in terms of uh, the, one of the factories in Denmark uh, for the uh, understanding of the different circuit opportunities to look in terms of uh, water and water supply and how that was being treated as you'll appreciate for uh, both for devices, but also medicine, we need extremely pure water uh, uh, supply, but how to do that in a way which is, um, uh, is, is as resource uh, protecting as possible, uh, given the, the conditions we have. So basically what uh, Nova Nordisk did here was to take this systematic innovation approach to see how we can close loops in terms of water, but also other uh, uh, material flows within the, uh, the company. This is part of the uh, Circular for Zero project uh, or campaign which Nova Nordisk is running, which is to see if they can get to a, a zero carbon uh, footprint uh, within a very, very short uh, period of time. And they're working extremely fast on here. And basically what uh, uh, Nova Nordisk learned from this uh, project, which was an accelerator project with us, but it was also connected up to a, uh, to, to a, a bachelor project here at DTU, was to see how we can bring different people from different parts of the organization together from the production and manufacturing sites to understand what are the organizational issues, what are the manufacturing issues, but also how can we uh, help those two uh, areas, particularly the manufacturing and the closing the loop of the manufacturing from a technology and data perspective. So how can we use that to uh, on our path for a circular economy? And I think they got a lot out of uh, this project. You can read more about this uh, case on the, uh, the Match website. So that was our small dip into the area for uh, uh, circular economy from a technology and data perspective. And we're interested now to see uh, what questions you may have. I can see there's some questions already coming up in the Q&A session. Over to you, Lassa, to, uh, to coordinate us there. Thank you, Tim. The first question is for you, Tim. That's from uh, Maria, and she is asking, um, how does a company know what data to collect and how do they know how to convert it into actual value, uh, valuable information? Right. 
Okay, that, that's a really interesting uh, and, and important question. Thanks, Maria, for that. Um, so basically, the idea is to uh, to to help the company to to um, have a view of their whole value chain and their and their product life cycle to see where to make the uh, to see the opportunities there. And maybe I could just uh, see if I can find. Excuse me, showing my all of my dirty washing over here. So if we look at the uh, the Match Project website here. Um, and if I were to sign in, I'm already signed in. If you look to the tools, we actually have some tools available. I'm just checking that you can see, yes, you seem to be able to. And then if I were to zoom in a little so you can maybe see it a bit better. Uh, if we filter the tools in terms of technology and data um, and look for uh, more strategic tools, here we can say, see straight away that we have a, a couple of tools here um, exactly to help us to do what you're asking, uh, Maria. First of all, the data science process. And by the, by the way, these two tools came from uh, one of our other uh, Nordic research projects, uh, the Circuit Project. And this is helping us to understand how to, to really step through uh, to get a business understanding, a data understanding, to prepare the data, to validate the data, to model it and so forth. So this is helping to, to guide us through where to identify what uh, what data we may have available, but also where to try and uh, to match our, uh, our, our data um, availability to the needs of the company or the opportunities we can see in the company. And then the other tool, which is also created in this, on the same project, uh, if I can just find this again, here we go. Uh, this is the uh, uh, so-called Smart Circular Economy Strategies Overview. Again, it's from the same uh, Nordic project. Uh, the circuit project and here we can see that um, this is you could say similar to the uh, uh, the example I showed from the Ellen, Ellen MacArthur um, book from 2016 this is about uh, restoring reducing avoiding then there's a, a number of strategies we can follow here if we're looking at recirculating parts and products there's a number of strategies and if we're looking at recirculating materials there's a number of strategies here so we do have some guidance here but you're absolutely right it's, uh, it's important to, um, to take a, a holistic view to see um, what would the, the, the data needs be from a usage and a, a value proposition perspective, and then to focus down on the area. Yeah, and if I may complement that, Tim, mm -hmm. I would say that we see mostly two types of companies, those that are really proactive and plan data collection before they actually start doing so, so that they can very strategically analyze the data and understand uh, how they could improve the lifetime, the product, the business models, and so forth. Yeah. This is type number one. But there are also lots of companies that they've been collecting data for quite a long time. Uh, they've, they've been having sensors in their products uh, due to other reasons. And now they are trying to understand how they could use that data to create new value in a circular economy context. Mm -hmm. And this is also an interesting approach. So it's a more kind of, um, looking for the treasure without have planned to have it there at the first instance. And we also see those companies actually taking advantage of, first of all, big data to then be able to understand how they can adapt the sensors that they are using to collect additional data that would enable their circular strategies. Yeah. So the two, the two ways seem to be possible. Daniela, Tim just presented that uh, the technology and data can, can definitely help us uh, reach more circularity, but didn't uh, technology also get us in this situation and how quickly a lot of technology is currently being outdated? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's really important to uh, take that into consideration. Of course, we are adding electronics uh, to products. And when we do add electronics, we also add complexity and we also add the potential issues we might have in the end of life if we don't really take care of the e-waste uh, in the proper way. And that's here again, why we need to have the systemic view for circular economy implementation, where we do try to understand how to uh, get more data and become more efficient but at the same time, how we can minimize the potential negative effects uh, of uh, having new electronics in, into those products. And if we do have a closed loop system and if we've designed the products and the sensors in a way that we can actually reuse them several times in different situations, then the advantages are much higher than the potential uh, impact. 
We should also remember that those are consuming energy uh, during the use phase. And that's again, extremely important to try to minimize uh, energy consumption to, to the largest extent possible. And we see companies working that direction uh, already. So overall, it is uh, a good thing to do if we do that well. And a very similar question, uh, but to you, Tim, how sustainable is it to add electronics and IoT into all sorts of projects? Is, is that really the way we're going? Yeah, good question. Uh, not necessarily. Um, so I think it depends on on how active we're going to use this. So I mean, it, there's all sorts of uh, reports and studies on how much we're uh, we're using of uh, our resources to to track and to trace and to to create and create data and to store data and so forth. I think that it, it's a difficult one to um, to to do a. Um, an eco balance study on, but the, there are those who are trying to do it. I think the uh, the idea is that um, we should be aware of it when we're designing our, our, our products and systems. And as long as we can uh, justify prolonging the life cycle and or getting more out of uh, our products, uh, there it, it should be possible to calculate. I think the only um, smart answer here is to say, uh, be aware of it once we're design when we're designing our products and systems. I don't think it's a given from the start. Thank you. Um, one last question before we finish the session uh, for you, Daniela. Um, what are your thoughts on non-manufacturing companies uh, to implement and leverage on technology and data? Yeah, that, there's of course lots of potential uh, in here. Also in relation to creating new platforms that can enable manufacturing companies to actually manage their products in the best way, or maybe platforms that can enable uh, consumers to share products and to enhance the e utilization uh, and so forth. So there's definitely lots of opportunities in implementing data not least uh, in the production kind of area, but across the entire value chain. And this should really be uh, looking into with good care. Uh, there's uh, basically three main trends currently in society that are shaping uh, our future. And two of them are the ones we are discussing just now, it's digitalization and circular economy as two really big mega trends. And I, and I really believe they can, they can become even more powerful if we put them together. What's the third mega trend, Daniela? So people don't go away from the webinar thinking, hmm, what was that? I need to remember that. <laughs> That's why I didn't mention. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> okay, in the meantime, we will uh, finish this session of technology and data, and then we'll do a three minute break and transition to, to our next uh, episode of use, support and maintenance. Thank you so much for your questions and uh, stay tuned for three minutes. Thanks for now.